Where we left off was we were looking at surface integrals. Now, I already sort of did part of that, and I'm not going to spend too much time reviewing that again, because as I said, I'm going to be sort of recovering all of this eventually anyway. But the basic idea was that we have some surface in space. It could be closed like a sphere, or it could just be some wobbly thing. It doesn't have to be closed. This is a not closed surface, as it were. It has a boundary in particular. Now, it could be a closed set, but there's a difference between that and a closed surface. So I'm thinking of this surface as having this boundary. As I said, it doesn't matter. What, I'm, what I want to do is I have some function that's defined on that surface, and I kind of want to add up all the values of the function on that surface, whatever that means. So what it actually meant was we were going to sort of somehow chop up the surfaces into little rectangular, or the surface rather, into little rectangular-like uh, mini areas. Now, none of these have to be flat. The surface could be quite curved. But if you take a fine enough grid of these things, then they become almost flat. And then you could take some value of the function in there, multiply by the little area, do that for every one of these boxes, and add them up. And instead of these boxes are little sort of parallelograms, actually, is what they turn out to be. And that, that's an approximation to the truth. Then, as always with an integral, we let the thing become more refined. Um, the boxes become smaller and the function values become more resolved, and you take a limit and everything just magically works. So the question is, how do you take an integral then, and all our integrals look like something d something. In this case, we're dealing with a surface, so it's a double integral, because these little, these little boxes are two-dimensional. The surface itself is two-dimensional. It's embedded in three dimensions, but the surface is two-dimensional. When you're walking on the surface of the Earth, you can go north-south or east-west. Those are the two dimensions. If you can leave the surface, you can go up and down, then that's the third dimension. But the surface itself is two dimensions, so you get a two-dimensional, a, a double integral, and you want to write something like f d sigma, where d sigma is sort of interpreted as a little bit of d area on the surface. And so what we're concerned about is how to compute an integral like this. I mean, this is a theoretical thing. It has a meaning, as I just described, but it's hardly practical to chop up the surface and do it. So what you, and do it as a limit. So what you want is some sort of way of correctly interpreting this as a regular old double integral. So the first way that we saw last time is I showed you the following. So, I'm going to just change this to a g. The function's going to be g, just to be consistent with the textbook. It doesn't matter, of course, what, the, what letter we use. Uh, but I was going to assume that the surface is something like this. It's in, I want to think of it as floating above the xy plane. Okay, So what I want to do is project it down to the xy plane. So this is the shadow. The surface could be quite wavy. It's like it's not a flat thing. It's, it, maybe I should even draw it sort of, I don't know. But what I want to be able to do is take the shadow looking down onto the xy plane. This is the first method. And now, if you do that, of course, you've got a bit of a problem if you have a sphere. Because then you actually have two points above each point in the shadow. So if, I don't want that. In this first case, first version of the surface, or the first method, if you like, is it works if the surface looks something like this. So it's a level set, as we've seen, these sorts of things are surfaces, but with a shadow on the xy plane, i.e., you only want one solution, one value of z for each choice xy. If you can do that, then you're open to use this method. And what we saw is that d sigma we saw last time 
that there's a formula for d sigma, which is grad f over grad f dot k, where, just to remind you, k is the unit vector in the z direction, 0, 0, 1. So we have i, j, and k. So k is that special vector. Now, we saw that this was one way. When I say we saw it, I have to confess I didn't prove it. I would have liked to have proved it. If anyone wants to stay at 9.30, I will show the reduced set, not on video, how to do it. If you, if you care, if you care. You can also ask me other things after then. But as it turns out, I say we saw it in the sense that I showed it to whoever was here and on the video. Now, here's, here was something that I wanted to stress. This is a vector, right? F is a scalar function. Grad F is a vector. So this is the modulus or the length of a vector. But when you take that same vector and you dot it with k, that means just take the third component of it. So this is a number. So this is actually an absolute value, the regular old absolute value of a number. All right, so we saw that. And I did some examples. And as I said, I'm going to be reviewing all this stuff anyway. So I don't want to get too bogged down on that. However, there was one sort of aspect of this that I did not finish uh, last time, which is that there is a notion of what's called a flux integral. And what I want to do is show you this notion. And then I will do a computation using this formula just to review. But then I'm going to show you the second version. Okay, so. Before I come to the second version, flux integral. Okay, Here, g is some function. And so the g d sigma, actually, before I do the flux integral, I should really just say one other thing. Uh, this led to, leads to the formula that g of x, y, z d sigma over s is equal to the integral of g of x, y, and I'm going to write z as a function of x, comma, y, times this mess. Well, x, y, z, if I can fit it. And then somehow in here, I need to squeeze in dx dy. Sorry, I couldn't quite fit that in. And in fact, now that we're saying it, I kind of need to have dA here, which I just omitted. Sorry about that. So fill this in. It's d sigma is something dA. So here, I've changed dA to dx dy, which is the same thing. And r is this shadow region here. R is the shadow. So I've told you what d sigma is. Here's the full formula with dx dy stuck in there. And what is the point of this? The point is that to compute this integral, we've reduced it to a regular double integral over a region R just in the xy plane. And all you have to do is compute these things as we saw and, and do it. So I should really have written that out before I started talking about flux integrals. Sorry about that. All right, so that's a sort of review of the end of last time. So what is a flux integral? Well, same sort of setting, but instead of writing the integral over a surface of a scalar function, so if we come back over here, g is a scalar, scalar function. So we're just adding up the values d sigma. If instead we have a vector field, so that's a vector function, then there's a different integral you need to write down. And I'm going to fill that in. But I want to show you the situation. Here's our same sort of surface, wobbly thing, whatever. And instead of having numbers attached to every point of it, Imagine we have a vector field. So we have a vector field on the surface. That means at every point, we have some vector. 
doesn't have to be tangent to the surface. It can be pointing in. For it to be a vector field though, it has to be kind of smooth. You don't want this vector to be like this and then really close to it, the, the vector to be in the opposite direction because I guess it's possible, but in between you'd have to smoothly transition along a curve like this from that way. Ooh, 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 ooh. So it's sort of like combing the hair, as it were. You don't want hair like mine, so just mohawk is sort of okay, but the problem is that you, you go from there to zero. They're not really okay. You kind of want just a smooth, a s smooth cut. Well, I'm not much of a hair cutter, so I don't know. I'm, I'm a bad one to talk about this. But in any case, that's the idea of the vector field. So what we want to do is we want to integrate that, but that's really sort of weird because it's not a scalar, it's a vector. So one thing that turns out to be quite important is to look at a specific vector field which is called the outer normal vector field. I don't even have enough room there, so I'm going to do it over here. So outward, this is to be filled in, outward normal vector field. So let's not worry about outward for the moment. Let's just look at a normal vector field. Okay, so that's just some sort of haircut, as it were. But there's a very special haircut, which is where the hairs are all spiking out normal to the surface. So if this is the surface, then what you do is you take this point, you take the tangent plane, and you go normal to that. It's like this. So you have a normal vector field. Now, if it's just normal, then these vectors could be of any length. So let's take a unit normal vector field, meaning that the vectors are all of length 1. So that's pretty much unique. That is pretty much unique. Actually, there's only one degree of ambiguity, and that is that the vectors could be length 1 but pointing the other way. They all have length 1, but they're pointing in exactly the opposite direction. So there is a certain ambiguity as to, for a unit normal vector field. Which one is it? Is it that one, or is it the negative of it? And those are the only two possibilities. Now, if you have a closed surface, as in a surface without boundary, like a sphere or a deformed sort of sphere, then if the surface is not too funky, So these are all normal in the sense that I'm taking, at this point, I take a tangent vector plane, then I take the normal to that. So it's sort of pointing up. Wherever you're standing on this weird asteroid, you know, you're a little person here, you're standing on the asteroid, gravity pulls you there, and as far as you're concerned, that's up. Okay, so that is the outer version of it. Of course, there's an inward one, which is just at every point the negative of the vector. So this is the outward unit normal. And this would be the inward unit normal. So if you have a closed surface, no boundary, then you can do this more or less if you're lucky. Most of the time you can. The surface is what's called orientable, meaning it has an inside and an outside. You know, you might think that every surface has an inside and outside, but if you take something like a Mobius strip, okay, that technically has a boundary, but you can sort of get around this. Uh, a Mobius strip, you've probably all made these out of bits of, out of paper. You sort of put a twist in the paper, and then you build it into a, a strip. And then if you land in your air on one side and you work your way around, then by the time you get here, you're actually on the other side. And then you keep on going, and then you're back to the first side. So it really only has one side. And therefore, you can't do an inside or an outside. There's no, there's no unit field that works on it. You can't really do it. You start taking normals this way, and when you get around it, you find that you, you can't match it up because you're pointing the other way. So we kind of want to stay away from surfaces like this, which are not orientable, and do not have unit normal vector fields in either direction. They, they just, they, they're weird. Okay, so banish all thoughts of this weirdness. Everything we deal with will be orientable, or none of this Mobius stuff. That's, by the way, the subject of things like topology. There's a mathematical branch called topology, 
which studies exactly these sorts of things. And one of the things they try to do is see whether surfaces have normal vector fields on them at all. So we're not going to worry about that. We're going to assume everything's nice. And now we're going to define this. We have a vector field f, and we're going to dot it with the normal vector field and write d sigma. And that is the flux. So this is, by definition, and you have to know this, this is the flux of the vector field f through the surface s. Flux of f through s. OK? So I want to emphasize, this is still a regular old double, well, surface integral, exactly like this. OK? Except that g is now f dot n. And remember, f dot n is a scalar. So we're still just integrating a scalar. But the problem is, if I just tell you the flux of f through s, then you have to understand what that means is you need to find n, the normal vector field. And then you need to dot it with f. And that, that's the sort of surface integral you need to set up first. Okay, so it's just an extra little step, but it's still a regular old surface integral. Now, you need to have a formula for n. And in the context that we were doing before, we were saying that the surface, we were assuming the surface s was some f of x, y, z equals a constant. In, in our version 1, this is, this is it. So we need a formula for n. And as it turns out, we have it. We already have it. We have seen that on this surface, we saw that the grad, the grad of f evaluated at x, y, z is perpendicular or normal to the surface. That's from even pre-midterm stuff. We saw that this is normal. So actually, the formula for the unit normal is just, it's just the gradient of f divided by the length of that vector, because it's supposed to be a unit normal. And the only thing is, I said I don't know whether which way it is. So I'm going to have to put a plus or minus and say that we're going to have to take care to get the right one. It's normally just a matter of looking at it, writing down the value for a couple of points, or even one point, and seeing whether the thing points up or down. All right, so now we have all the ingredients to do a problem. It seems like there's quite a lot of ingredients, but everything just reduces quite nicely. So it says you have a field f, which is written as z squared i plus x times j minus 3z times k. And just for our point of reference, this could have been written as just z squared x minus 3z. At every point in space, x comma y comma z, there is a vector attached to that point in space. And the question is to find the flux of this field through, and it says actually outward, so that tells you which way the normal is going to have to be, through and the surface S, where we've got to say what S is. S is the parabolic cylinder z equals 4 minus y squared cut by the planes x equals 0, x equals 1, and z equals 0. Well, isn't that lovely? Where's my eraser? All right, right there, this is the problem. So the first thing we have to do is recognize what we're looking for. Again, no one is going to tell you what the flux integral is in symbols. It's just going to say, find the flux 
So you, the first thing you have to know is the formula that I had written up before. So here goes. We're going to write down flux that we're looking for is exactly the double integral over this surface S, which is defined over there, of F dot N d sigma. N is the outward normal to S. Okay, so, whoops. Anyway, so what does S look like? Well, if we draw this parabola, it's, uh, what is it, Z equals, uh, Z equals 4 minus Y squared. So let's see. Here's Z, here's Y, here's 4. I think you'll see the intercepts here are 2 and minus 2. So it looks like that in the ZY plane, because it doesn't depend on X, it's actually a cylinder. That's the whole, that's the whole thing. So you just make a, this out of, make a cylinder out of it, back and forth. But we have to cut it with certain planes. So we're told that X equals 0 and X equals 1. Well, here's x equals 0, here's x equals 1. So actually, we don't need this part of it. We just have an arch like this. And also, z equals 0 is the xy plane. So the surface is this whole arch. OK, so it's a little bit ambiguous to me to say what outward means. But I think we can agree that if we're standing under the arch, we're kind of thinking of this as inwards. So the outwards normal should be should be this, out of the arch. I mean, that's, a, I don't want to get all legalistic and say, you know, what's outward and not. It's not a closed surface is the point. So it's just, yeah, I mean, it's not a closed surface because it has a boundary. And so there's no inside or out of it. But you know, that's, I'm interpreting outward to be that. And I'll stick, I'll, st I'll stand by it. OK, so what, in order to set this up, I need a description of the surface. So I, I'd like to write the surface as f of something. I'd like to write the surface as that. And actually, it's not so hard to do it, because we already have this description here. So what I'm going to do is just slightly manipulate it. And I'm going to write it as y squared plus z minus 4 equals 0. And if you wanted to, you could get exactly the same answer by writing it as y squared plus z equals 4. It doesn't matter if you have a constant. The derivatives are all going to be 0. I, I kind of just always put 0 on the right-hand side. It's just personal preference. That way, I don't even have to tell the difference between constants and variables until I differentiate. All right. So what do we have? If that, that is the equation of s, so never mind exactly where these cuts are. That will just control the bounds of the integral. So I'm going to set up. I'm going to call this f. So this is f. And so I need to find grad f. And so as you recall, to do that, I take the x derivative, 0. I take the y derivative, it's 2y. And I take the z derivative, 1. And you see that the you still get the same. Still get the same gradient. Now, we really want to find the unit normal. So let's compute. The length of this, you just use the standard formula. It's the square root of 0 squared plus 2y all squared plus 1 squared, otherwise known as root 4y squared plus 1. So the unit normal, n, is plus or minus grad f over its norm, its length, which is plus or minus 0, 2y, 1 over this positive quantity root 4y squared plus 1. And now we have to decide, is it plus or is it minus? Is it plus or is it minus? Well, look at the z direction. The z direction is upward. OK, so that's if it's 1. Whereas if you had the minus, it would be downward, it, roughly speaking. It wouldn't point straight downwards, but it's more down than up. So which one do we want? Do we want the up or do we want the down? I think we want the up, right? In particular, here it is actually directly up. So it clearly cannot be minus. That's, that's, the, that's the inward one. So we want upward. 
So we take plus. That's, that's it. We don't need plus or minus. We just take the plus option. So there's the n. Well, it's either plus or minus. I looked at the z coordinate, which is either 1 if it's always plus, or minus 1 if it's minus. Okay? So take any vector. Take any value of y. Okay? Zero. Say y equals 0. So that corresponds to these points over here. So I want the thing to point upwards, which is 0, 0, 1. If I had taken a minus, it would be that the normal is 0, 0, minus 1. No you good. Rely on what decided before. Yes, I, I mean, I have to sort of understand what it meant by outward. Okay, okay it was an ambiguous, but I, as I say, it is consistent with what I had decided before. I, I don't think there's really any ambiguity in it, but I'm just saying if you felt particularly loyally, you might be able to argue that somehow the inside of the arch was up. Anyway, never mind that. Um, so, okay, we have one of our ingredients, n, but we kind of need what d sigma is as well. But before we do d sigma, we're going to start up f dot n. We're going to need f dot n because it appears in our flux integral. So f is the original function, which is written on that board. I'm just, it came from the question. I'll just write it out again. It was z squared x minus 3z that vector, and we need to dot it with this normal vector here, 0, 2y, 1, over the length, 4y squared plus 1. And that's just a constant, so we'll leave that. Instead, we just dot this together. You get 0 times z squared is nothing. You're going to get 2xy. So I'm, I'll pull out this constant. And the dot product gives us 2xy minus 3z. Okay, so we have gotten our integrand, the f dot n piece, right? I'm looking up at this integral here. We worked out n first, then we found f dot n. Now we've got to deal with the d sigma piece. So that's where we go to the formula that I wrote down before. Here goes. We have seen, so I said d sigma is equal to the length of the gradient of f over gradient f dot k dA. That was the formula I wrote before. Luckily, we have everything we need. We've already worked out what the gradient of f is. In fact, we've already worked out its length. It's root 4y squared plus 1. But what about the grad f dot k? Well, let's just pan over to this board here, and we saw grad f was 0, 2y, 1. What the hey? I'll just write it out again over here. It's so simple. So what's grad f dot k? Well, you just take the z component. That's what this means. This is just means the z component. It's always the z component. gradient of f. It doesn't have to be a constant, it just happens to be 1 in this case. So the bottom is the absolute value of 1, which is 1. Not so bad. And dA we can also think of as dx dy. It's the same thing. Nice. So we have all the ingredients that we need, almost, to set up our integral. So flux equals the double integral over s of f dot n d sigma which is, I'm going to leave this blank and come back to it, and we definitely need to pay some attention to it. f dot n we saw was 1 over root 4y squared plus 1 times this quantity 2xy minus 3z. And as it turned out, d sigma was just root 4y squared plus 1 dx dy. This handily cancels with that. That's actually quite common that this happens. In order to make sense of this, we have to understand that this is an integral over some region R, where R is the shadow of the surface. So let's come back over here to our picture and ask, well, the shadow on the xy plane is actually this rectangle. So this is R, the shadow. 
So according to my prescription, to do the integral over the surface, you have to do a different integral over the shadow. And that's what this business is. This factor here converts you from the curvy sort of surface, plop down onto the shadow. That's how it works. Now, this shadow over here, you can see the values of x go from 0 to 1, and the values of y go from minus 2 to 2. That wasn't given. That only comes out of the picture. So according to this, what I just said, the values of x, which is I wrote dx first, go from 0 to 1 to 1, and the values of y from minus 2 to 2. So just write this out again because it's too messy. We have converted this sort of flux integral into a fairly standard sort of double integral, but there's one little problem. What's the problem? Yeah, we still got a z. So in the formula, I was at pains to say that we had to write z in terms of x and y for this to make sense. And guess what? We can because z equals 4 minus y squared. So convert this double integral into 2xy minus 3 outside of 4 minus y squared dx dy. <laughs> okay, so now we're back to a regular old double integral. Okay, uh, maybe what I'll do, I'll just do it quickly because it doesn't take too long, but I don't want to spend too much time on the fairly standard stuff. Let's just write this out for, for completeness. So you could actually reverse the bounds here without doing any extra work if you wanted to, but we might as well do the x integral first. If you do the x integral, uh, the integral of 2x is x squared minus 12x plus 3xy squared, and that's evaluated between 0 and 1. If you plug in 0, everything goes away. If you plug in 1, you find the integral from minus 2 to 2 of y minus 12 plus 3y squared dy. Hopefully that is correct. And I think that you should get this as minus 32. And this is now a single integral. I'll let you fill in the details there. You do. You just integrate that as normal. OK. So it seems fearsome. But if you understand the steps and you know the correct formulas and you know what you're looking for, it's not so bad. It's not so bad. It's all about converting the crazy looking thing which doesn't this is not amenable to computation into something that's extremely amenable to computation and then doing the computation. You see the main point is actually the first part of it. The computation, if I were grading this I'd give you know 7 out of 10 even for getting up to that. that. The rest of it is, is not a big deal. 8 out of 10. Alright, but I'm not grading it so you can't count on that. Are there any questions about that example, flux integrals in general? Yes. I'm sorry? That's a very good question. You may have noticed that the grad f cancels there. And in fact, if you use this method, it is always going to cancel. So you could write this using this method as the following. You're going to have f dot grad f over grad f, and then the d sigma is grad f over grad f dot k d a. Capital F is the field, small f is the surface, or the equation of the surface. So actually, yes, these do cancel always. And if you wanted to learn a formula for the flux integral as just f dot grad f over grad f dot k da, that's true. You could learn that and save yourself a tiny little bit of work. But the fact, of it, the fact is that that's just another formula to learn 
So I don't know, you kind of have to know the other two and they all fit together very nicely. But you, you make the correct observation that, that yes, uh, grad F will always cancel. So the point being in this example, this is not a coincidence that this cancelled out with this. You could save a little bit of time by realizing that that, that is always going to happen, as you see from here. Okay, so it's a good point. So I leave it up to you to decide whether you want to do it the way that I did it or learn this formula here. Or maybe... You just cross it out. In any case, it doesn't take very long to take a square root and write it down and then cross it out after all. All right, any other questions about that? Okay, let's move on to a, another quick method and this shouldn't take too long and then I'm, I'm going to move on to the two big theorems, Stokes and the divergence theorem, and that will pretty much complete the course. Okay, so another way of describing a surface is parametrically. So this is 16.6 parametric version and this is the second version of how to deal with a surface. So it's possible that you have two parameters, which are sometimes u and v, but of course you have to be flexible with the variable, no variable names. Suppose you have parameters. Now instead of the variable t, which we often use to parameterize a curve, to get to deal with the surface, you need two parameters. So let's call them u and v. So the, basically the idea is, remember, if, if a curve is parameterized by t, you know when you know t is, then you know where you are on the curve. Okay, t equals 3. Oh, that's the point 5, 6, 2. t equals 4. Now we're here. Well, with a surface, you kind of need two points, two parameters. So I kind of think of it as a coordinate. Well, it is a coordinate system on here. Here's the lines of constant u. It's like a grid. So this is u equals 1, u equals 2, u equals 3, u equals 4, u equals 5. And here's the curves of constant v. And so it forms a sort of coordinate system. So if you know u, comma v, you know where you are on the surface. So in particular, what you're going to need is that x is now a function of u and v, y is a function of u and v, and z is a function of u and v. So if you know u and v, you can plug it into those three formulas, and you get the point x, y, z, and it tells you where you are in space. And together, this hopefully forms a surface. So another way of looking at it is that you have this vector r of u comma v and you could write it as instead of x sometimes so you can preserve x y and z sometimes you say f g and h whatever this is just all playing with letters ultimately it all represents the same thing so this is or x or y or z okay so r is the position vector in space as u and v vary that vector maps out a surface and if these functions are relatively smooth, then the surface will also be smooth and it will have tangent lines. So um, what you want in particular is you don't want to duplicate. You know, param parametric curves can cross themselves. Here the surface could come back and cross itself. We, we kind of don't want that. We don't, we don't want any inter self-intersections. So we, we, we want what you would say is a one-to-one -one map from the UV space onto the surface. But that's sort of technical. Um, OK, so some examples first. Suppose the surface is the sphere. x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals, say, I don't know, a squared. I'll leave, it, I'll leave the radius as a. So this is a surface. How would you parameterize that? It's radius a. Well, you just use spherical coordinates, except that instead of r, you set r equals a. So in spherical coordinates, we had x used to be equal to r sine phi cosine theta. That's the full spherical coordinates. But again, everywhere on this surface, we know r equals a. So we'll, the radius is a. So I'll write a sine phi cosine theta, y is a sine phi sine theta, and z has to be a cosine phi. So that is the parameterization with, instead of u comma v, 
I'm using phi comma theta. Those are the two variables. So that replaces u comma v. Now, that's the parameterization in formulas, but we kind of need to know what is the range of phi and theta. And this comes straight out of spherical coordinates. Phi lives in 0 pi, whereas theta lives in 0, 2 pi. Technically, you don't need 0 and 2 pi because then you've gone all the way around. I just want to remind you that this describes a point on the surface. To get the phi, you measure this angle here. So you start up, you point to the North Pole, and then you find out, you go down. And you never have to go down past the South Pole because then you could have gone the other way. So that's why you only need to go from 0 to pi. You don't want to go past the South Pole. If you get up to pi, you're at the South Pole. Anything further, why didn't you just go that way? Whereas theta controls where you are around the little circle that you end up with. It's not a great circle, but OK, we're going down. And then theta, well, actually, we should go this way. OK, and if you go around 2 pi, you're back to where you started. So you shouldn't have gone So at all. So you should have stayed. So some way of looking at this is that if I draw a graph, here's the phi axis. Actually, draw that the wrong way. If, I, if this is the theta axis and this is the phi axis, the interior of that rectangle gets warped, warpingly mapped onto the sphere. For every point inside this rectangle, there's exactly one point inside the sphere. Or on the, not inside, but rather on the boundary of the sphere. That's, that's the important point. So this maps the surface. These points, unfortunately, all go to the North Pole. And these points here all go, no, that's not right. These points all go to the North Pole. These points all go to the South Pole. So it's a bit degenerate. All those points. And all these points go to the South Pole. Whereas this point here is the same as this point. Go figure. This point is the same as this point. So that's how you turn this into a sphere. You fold it around so that this touches this, and then you get a loop, and then you squish this and squish this into one. There, it's a sphere. All right. So that's a parameterization. Here's another one. OK, if you have a cone, z squared equals, say, x squared plus y squared. That's this double cone here. How would you parameterize that? Well, you'd use r comma theta this time instead of u comma v. And so a good way to do it is to write that x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta, and then z is just r. And indeed, x squared plus y squared will equal r. So for every point theta, you get a point on, this, on the cone. Now, the problem is, what is r? Well, you'd like r to be positive. It's because of the root of the base, but actually, if r is negative, then you get the bottom half of the cone. If r is positive, you get the top half of the cone, and everyone, everything sort of works out. So actually, here, r, if you want the whole cone, well, r is just any real number, whereas theta, again, only needs to be between 0 and 2 pi, because once you start getting to 2 pi, you start wrapping, wrapping around again. So. That will parameterize the cone very nicely. Um, all right. So that's, that's some examples of parameterizations. Now, let's see how to do a surface integral where the surface is described in this sort of parametric form instead of in the form f of x, comma y, comma z equals c, like the previous version. So surface integrals in parametric form. OK, you have this r which would be, say, fg of h, where these are functions of u and v. So for example, if I'm dealing with this, I would go, this is a different r. This is a, a vector r. And this is a scalar r. So this is r cosine theta, r sine theta, r for the cone. Or for the sphere, you pack up those three things over here. here 
to it's a vector a sine phi cos theta comma a sine phi sine theta comma a cosine phi all right so we pack them up and we have a notion of dr du and which we could write as r subscript u and we have a notion of dr dv which i would call r subscript v so again not everything is always u in here, u and v are r and theta. So we would have r with respect to r is equal to the derivative with respect to r of this, which is just cosine theta, sine theta, 1. And we also have the theta version of it, dd theta of r cosine theta r sine theta r, which if you compute it is negative r sine theta, r cosine theta zero. So there we differentiated with respect to theta. And you got something altogether different. Okay, so what is the point sorry? Yeah, okay. So what is the point of doing this? Well, it turns out, and again, it would be re really lovely to see this using geometry, but we don't really have much time. So it turns out, first of all, we have a formula for the normal to a surface, which is, it's the u derivative cross the v derivative. So this is the cross product of two vectors over the norm of it. Provided, so we're going to assume that somehow we have this cross product is never zero. It's not the zero vector. Because if it were the zero vector, then you'd be dividing by zero and you'd kind of be screwed. So hopefully that quantity is not zero. So not only do you have this, but you have the lovely formula for d sigma, which is much, much nicer than the formula that we had before. Uh, uh, the formula we had before becomes this. It's just this du dv. So those are two things well worth learning. So in particular, if you're doing a flux integral, f dot n d sigma in parametric form, then you can see this time I will do what you wanted to do last time and the cancellation. This is going to cancel with this, and you are simply going to get that this is f dot the vector r u cross r v du dv. And now, this is a double integral over the correct region of u and v. This is over the u and v in the correct, in the, in the parametric region. So when I say the parametric region, you may notice over here I took pains not just to write down the parameterization, but to say where does r go between, where does theta go between. And the same thing in the case of b. That tells you what limits to use or what the region looks like. All right, so now we have this formula. We can actually apply it. I'll do a couple of examples. Okay, so this is actually from set 11. Set 11. So it's going to be, it says use a parameterization to find the outward flux away from the z-axis. So find flux away from the z-axis. of the field and f is equal to minus x minus y z squared through the surface s where s is given by z is the square root of x squared plus y squared between z equals 1 and z equals 2. All right. Okay, so this is just actually the same we're looking at. 
but the only difference is that Z is positive here, so actually that gets rid of the bottom half of it. So it's just the top half of this cone. But we actually only need to go as well between Z equals 1 and Z equals 2. So it's just this part of the cone. So you've taken your ice cream cone and you bit the bottom off. And you're left with that. And the ice cream has fallen out because you were silly to do that. But that's what you're left with, the surface. All right. So it's telling you the, outer, the outward normal is the one away from the z-axis. So actually, if I come back over here, I kind of made a mistake. I forgot the plus or minus. So you have to look at which way it is. It's, you still have to use your intelligence there. OK. So we've already parameterized this before. We, we're going to use the parameterization r equals r cosine theta, r sine theta, r, as we did before, where r is going to go from what to what. This time, we're not going to go from minus infinity to infinity. If you notice, know, this is equal to z. This is the same thing as z. So since z goes between 1 and 2, r is going to go between 1 and 2. So you need to be able to write that. On the other hand, we do want theta to go all the way to 2 pi. It doesn't matter if you put an equals here. That, that just wraps around, and you only get one little join point duplicated. Not a big deal. Uh, if you only wanted half the cone, so you've already taken the chomp out of it, if for some reason you want to split this sort of ridiculous cone with your friend, and you take a knife and go, you only get half of it, then you might only go from 0 to pi, for example. But as it happens, we want the whole thing around, so we have our 2 pi. All right, so there's the parameterization that we're using. We already computed r cross uh, r r, the r, little r derivative of the vector r. So I, I just want to emphasize again that, unfortunately, this r and this r are completely different. I wish that they were more distinguishable. But the convention is always to use this vector r, and then for polar coordinates, you use little r. Well, that's tough. Okay, so what we need to do is we're going to need to work out r r cross r theta. So these are derivatives. And so this is the vector cosine theta sine theta 1 cross the vector minus r sine theta r cosine theta 0. So we need to compute that. And if we do, the only way I can really think of is just to set up the standard cross product matrix and compute the determinant. So I copy this in, cosine theta sine theta 1 minus r sine theta r cosine theta 0. And if I do this, I get some number of i's. How many is it? 0 sine theta minus r cosine theta. And then I get some number of j's. How many is it? Well, it's 0 cosine theta minus minus this but of course, you need a minus as well. So I think if you actually work it out, you'll get a minus r sine theta. And then how many k's do you need? Well, you need cosine squared theta times r plus sine squared theta times r. So you actually get r cosine squared theta plus r sine squared theta, which is just r. So in summary, I'll just write this out as minus r cosine theta i minus r sine theta j plus r k. Now I ask you this. This is a vector which you can write as minus r cosine theta minus r sine theta r. There's the vector that is this. And this is a normal. But which way does it point? It's not necessarily a unit normal, because to get the unit normal we divide. But which way does it point? Is it up? Or is it down? Is it the, what's the correct vector? Is it that, or is it it's negative? Well, look at the z-coordinate. r is between 1 and 2. Is the z-coordinate positive or negative? It's positive. r is between 1 and 2. So the z-coordinate there is r, which is between 1 and 2. So this vector, whatever it is, is pointing more up than it is down. So look at this typical normal. What's the z-coordinate of that vector? Z is this way. Is that vector negative z or positive z? It's negative. It's going more down. So this is not the correct one. This will give us the negative of the correct answer. 
So this is where you have to use a little bit of little bit of geometry. So we actually are going to need this will point the wrong way. So we will need the unit normal to be the negative of this. R cosine theta, R sine theta minus R over the norm of this. Okay, do you all see why you need to do that? Switch it around. Is that, is that unclear to anyone? I mean, all you have to do is draw the vector somewhere. If you had R positive, if R was actually positive, it would be this normal, because that's the Z. So you'd be getting always the inward normal, wherever you were. No good. You want the other one. So the Z coordinate has to be negative. Okay, now we're in a position to complete the problem. So according to what I've said, the flux integral you can write directly f dot n d sigma over the surface is. So instead, it is f dot r u cross r f du dv. But again, I actually need a minus here. So maybe I should just come back over here. This is probably a few, like a little bit further back in your notes. So maybe plus or minus there, but you have to know which one to use. It's the same as the choice of the normal. So careful here, this is a trick. We need the minus. We need the minus. If we got it wrong, we just get the negative of the answer. Anyway, the point being that f was given to us. Uh, let's go back and say, what is f? We look back. We haven't used it yet. It was minus x minus y z squared. We need to change that to parameters. So x was r cosine theta, y was r sine theta, and z was r. So that's what f is. In fact, I'm just going to copy it here. Minus r cosine theta minus r sine theta r squared dot this mess, which we just computed, we don't even need the denominator, we just need the numerator of it, r cosine theta, r sine theta minus r. And it's that dr d theta, where as I said, r goes from 1 to 2 and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. And again, we've almost finished completing it, com well, writing it as a double integral. If you do, we have to just take the dot product. That's the only thing left. So you're going to get minus r squared cosine squared theta minus r squared cosine squared theta. So I believe this just becomes minus r squared, but then you'll have a minus r cubed as well. So I took this times this, plus this times this, plus this times this, and I just used a simple trig thing to, uh, to make it fall out. All right. So... This is fairly straightforward. In fact, the d theta thing just falls right out. You can just do it like this if you want to. Uh, minus r cubed over 3, minus r to the fourth over 4, evaluated between 0 and 1, d theta. And if you work this out, you get minus a third, minus a fourth. Is that right? Oh, it's 1 to 2. Thank you. So I knew there's something a little bit strange. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, this works out as, well, then you'll have the 2 pi, of course, times, I think it's 28 plus 45 over 12, once you take a common denominator. And I got probably wrong, but I think it's minus 73 pi over 6. In any case, it's a fairly straightforward integral by that point. Question. Yeah, the cross product is exactly the Jacobian. So, so you have the R that's right. So this um, this is not just a, a, a uh, it's not a cylinder. If you're using cylindrical coordinates, it would be R dr d theta. 
but because we this is basically conical coordinates and conical coordinates then you have essentially the Jacobian is the length of this which if you work it out is not r but root 2 times r that's the that's the length of that. If we hadn't done it uh, parameterized and we'd done it uh, using the other method. The other way, yeah, it would be the same thing. You wouldn't need the r d r d theta. You wouldn't need the r d r d theta, right? This method's not involved in r d r d theta. But if you use regular old cylindrical coordinates and you compute the the Jacobian, the norm of this, this is the Jacobian on the bottom here, then you will find yes, you get r. Here you get root two r, so it's conical coordinates. So this is actually a generalization of cylindrical coordinates, except that you don't integrate in the third variable z. It's only for a double. So it's really polar coordinates in a sense. Okay, so it's a good way to interpret it, but the formulas speak for themselves. All right, any questions about that example? Ah, you guys are quiet. All right, well, in that case, let's move on to Stokes' theorem. Okay, so I want to remind you that if you have a three-dimensional vector field F, then we have this concept of the curl. This is the curl. And to find it, you just sort of take the operator d dx, d dy, d dz, and you cross that with F. So you do what comes naturally, as it were. Now, Here's what Stokes' theorem says. So this is really, there's only one formula in this section, and then the whole, the whole deal is to apply it. Okay, so the setting is this. We have some surface with a boundary, and I'm going to insist that it's orientable, so there's none of this Mobius strip hanky-panky. So there's the boundary of a surface, and I think of it as like a little cap sitting above there. It could be flat, but I don't know. I get the clearest picture in my mind thinking of it as some cap. Okay. So the boundary is called C, and it has some sort of positive orientation, which is like anti-clockwise, counterclockwise. And this sets up the notion of the outer normal by using a sort of right-hand rule. The outward normal to the surface is then you put your thumb around and you see where your fingers go. So they're going up in this case. So normally, if you're going counterclockwise in some sense, then the normal is up. If you're going clockwise, the normal is down. But it's sort of hard to turn your head around and see, especially since actually the curve could go around here. It's all three-dimensional stuff. So, uh, so you, the right-hand rule is the only way to be sure of where the outer normal is. And then you just you find the outer normal near the curve, and then you just kind of fill it in everywhere else. And we're assuming you can fill it in. The Mobius strip, you cannot fill it in because you get back the wrong way. So. That's not assumed to happen. We're also assuming that the surface is pretty smooth. Actually, it doesn't have to be smooth. It can have pieces which are smooth. So you could have like a cube sitting on most of a cube, like an open packing box sitting on top of a square. That's OK, because in pieces or panes, it's, uh, it's smooth, even though there's corners, as long as it's not too spiky. You don't want to do this to a hedgehog, for example. All right. so. Here is what the theorem says. The line integral around the boundary, so the surface is C, and the boundary with this orientation, uh, I'm sorry, the surface is S, the boundary is the contour C. So the line integral, and we saw line integrals before, f dot dr, so that's adding up all the values of f, the vector field, but dotted with the tangent r. So everywhere you've got to look just at the vector field here on this boundary. That's all you care about. Just the values of the vector field dotted with these tangent vectors. And then uh, not exactly, not exactly, although the flux is going to be in the second integral. So it, it is equal to the flux. 
We sort of interpreted this as the flux version of Green's theorem, but I'll talk about that in a few seconds. This turns out to be the same as the integral on the whole surface of the curl of F, the flux of that, dot N, d sigma. That's the formula. Okay, it's a pretty complicated looking formula. I just want to specify once again, S is piecewise smooth. The boundary is, is C oriented the same way. And N is the outer, or N is the compatible normal vector field to S as it was before. C is just uh, C is the, the boundary of it. Yeah. Yeah. C is the is the is the rope. Exactly. There's the edge and then you close it with something. This is like a tent. It's a tent. C is the boundary around the bottom of the tent. Okay. So it seems sort of preposterous that the values of this integral, so this integral depends on f everywhere, and you're adding up all the little curls of f dot the n. So you're taking this everywhere, and that is just depending on the values of f on that boundary there. That's what it's saying. But if you think about it, it's maybe not so preposterous, because if you write something like this, df dx, It's just f of b minus f of a. That's the fundamental theorem. If you take the integrate derivative, then you just have f of b minus f of a. So it's saying, wait, this is a whole integral. It depends on the values of capital F, or at least the derivative of it, everywhere between a and b. No, it doesn't. It only depends on f of b and f of a, the boundary points. This is the exact same thing. Here is a derivative. So this is saying if you integrate the derivative, it's only the boundary points that, can, that count. But the tricky thing is that the boundary is not just f of b minus f of a. It's an integral of its own. But it's a one-dimensional integral. This is actually a zero-dimensional integral. It's just two points, bang and bang. So actually, this theorem reduces to this. If you work instead of two-dimensionally or three-dimensionally, just one-dimensionally. Sort of hard to see, but what is a little bit easier to see is that it reduces to a form of Green's theorem that we've already done. So if it turns out that the surface is in the xy plane and the rope is in the xy plane, so you just take a rope that's sitting in the xy plane, you could take any surface S, like a tent, but imagine your tent is just actually a tarp on the ground. Okay, so there's really no z-ness in this whole thing. So it will turn out then that n is just k. The unit normal is always up. No, nothing interesting. Okay, and then in this case, you'd get the formula f dot dr around the boundary is equal to the double integral, the curl of f dot k. And instead of d sigma, you just get dA because the surface is not interesting. It's just d sigma is dA. Now, that was Green's theorem version 2. If you look back at your notes, this is, I think, well, whatever, that's the flux form of, of Green's theorem. So we've just sort of, we're still dealing with a surface, but instead of thinking of the region and the plane, we've gone, popped out into three dimensions. And in, now the C doesn't have to be in the plane, it can be, so I don't even think of the rope. The, cur the bottom of the tent can be like this. It can just be suspended in space, and you have some cap over it. Or the cap doesn't even have to be suspended over it. It can be over and under and over and under, as long as it's sort of it's like a, a rubber sort of membrane around this wire that's in space, and it can, the, the membrane can be out or in, all right? Or, or parts of it can be up, and parts of it can be down. Okay, so that formula that I've written there just generalizes it. Now, I definitely want to look at some examples, but I think it's good to have some intuitive idea of what the hell it means from a purely sort of, 
well, physical point of view. Because this is actually a formula from physics. And flux, as we saw, has a notion of flow. It has a notion of flow to it. So I gave an analogy when I did Green's theorem, and this is just the same analogy. But here's my sort of C that's in, sorry, in space. And here's my sort of weird cap. Now, the curl of F was supposed to measure the sort of roundaboutness of the field at this point. So what does that mean? Well, the field points in a certain direction. And the idea is if you put a little paddle there or put a little bit of gas or a marble or something like that, you want to work out. So here we are at this point on the surface, and we have this vector field. And so I'm thinking of it. Maybe the best way to think of it is you have a bunch of marbles sitting around here, and this field is like the wind. But the marbles are magnetically roll around. And so the question is here, when I look at the flux, I want to see what's the rate of the marbles rolling around this point, right near the point. Now, of course, they don't have to roll around. They can sort of move in a, in a funny way. But the net effect, if you just look at it, will be some sort of rotation one way or the other, or maybe none at all. So the steady sort of state of this is this sort of flow of marbles. And now what I'm doing is adding up this flows everywhere on the surface. And the beautiful thing about adding this up is that the difference of the flows actually, if they had the same flow, these two points, then somehow when I'm looking at, well, this point and this point, this flow goes this way, this flow goes this way, and the net effect is actually, if they're exactly the same, is to cancel out. So the flow about this little point would be canceled out, and all you'd see if these points were really close together is no flow at all. So if you got rid of these marbles and just looked at the ones there, they'd be flowing around. These ones would be flowing around, but when you put them both together, there's a bit of cancellation. This is stronger than this, then what's left is the net flow due to those two points. And the thing is, we're adding it up everywhere. And everything cancels out except at the boundary. And if you look at what happens, you get. So you get this little bit uncancelled, this little bit uncancelled, this little bit. And you actually end up with the vector field itself added up. OK, that's extremely hand wavy and ad hoc. Obviously, you're not going to be asked a question about that. I just wanted you to sort of have some vague feel of why you can add up these derivatives, these curls, as the flows have everything cancel except the bits of the field on the boundary. OK, don't worry too much if that doesn't make any sense. Uh, maybe you prefer to think of it as a bunch of paddles interfacing and but I think the important thing is you should be able to see that these things more or less cancel out, except that there's no cancellation on the boundary. Anyway, this doesn't particularly help you solve problems. So uh, here are two problems from finals. from the textbook. But these are good problems. OK. So this is from session one, uh, session 11, rather. It's problem one. And it's actually from the textbook. So S is the cylinder. x squared plus y squared equals a squared, where z is between 0 and h. And the top, where the top is x squared plus y squared less than or equal to a squared, and z equals h. So let's just draw this thing first. It's actually pretty straightforward. The cylinder is just your standard cylinder of radius A. And we're going up to height H. So this is radius A. We're going up to height H. And the surface is this part of the cylinder as well as the top, but not the bottom. Open at the bottom. OK, so that's the surface. We have a vector field, of course. f, which I'll write as minus y x comma x squared. So that's a vector field. And the question is to find the flux of flux through s of the vector field, or outward flux 
flux through S of the curl of F. Okay, so this is very similar to the problems that we've been looking at before, except that finding, before we just found the outward flux of F, here we're finding the outward flux of the curl. So that's sort of like saying find the integral of the derivative. So you don't go and do all the work that we did before, which is a lot of mess. You instead use Stokes' theorem. So the, the, the key point that you have to notice between the two questions is that this is the curl. Of course, the question actually said use Stokes' theorem to find it, but that was kind of, you know, the textbook likes to be a little gentler than the examiners do, so your key thing should be, ah, flux of the curl, okay, Stokes' theorem. Flux of the curl, probably Stokes' theorem is the correct thing to use. All right, so let's do it. First of all, the outward normal is this. At the top, it's like that, around the sides, outwards from the tin can. So the compatible thing, of course, is the clockwise path here. To check it, what you do is you put your thumb on the edge of the can, and you go and you see, you take your right hand, and you see that your fingers, when they hit the can, are pointing out of it. Compare this to if you went the other way, then your fingers would be going into the can. Right? Out, in. So we're going to take C is just the circle x squared plus y squared equals a squared in the xy plane, i.e. z equals zero. Okay, so according to Stokes' theorem, the flux that we're looking for, which is, remember, you need to understand what flux is. That's the flux of the curl, according to Stokes' theorem, is just equal to the one-dimensional line integral of f dot dr around c. And so instead of having to do a surface integral, we just have to do a line integral. So we're back in the mode of doing line integrals. Remember, we have done double integrals, triple integrals, and we've done line integrals and surface integrals. You need to know how to do all these different types directly, but believe me, you always prefer to do a line integral than a surface integral. So the way we do this is we parameterize that c was x squared plus y squared equals a squared once around the counterclockwise. And z equals zero. That's important. So we're going to parameterize c just by the one variable r. So we'll write x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta. Actually, it's not the variable r at all. It's the variable a. So x is a cosine theta, y is a sine theta, and z is 0. So the variable here, a is just given in the problem. And they, they could have called it 3 or you know something, but they, they just left it as variable. So a is variable. Uh, sorry, a is just whatever is in the question, but theta is the parameter, and it goes from 0 to 2 pi. And so we can write the r of this c as a cosine theta, a sine theta, 0. And so dr is, just differentiate it as minus a sine theta, a cosine theta, 0, d theta. And f, finally, we come back to the original f. Again, notice how in these problems the f only pops up right in the end of the thing. It was minus y x x squared. Is that right? Yeah. And so we've got to convert this to y is a sine theta. Minus a sine theta. x is a cosine theta. And x squared happens to be a squared cosine squared theta. And so f dot dr, or the integral of f dot dr, becomes the integral of the one parameter. Line integrals have one parameter. Surfaces is where you need two. So theta is the parameter. It's this f minus a sine theta, a cosine theta, a squared cosine squared theta, 
dot dr, which is minus a sine theta, a cosine theta, zero d theta. And so you do this dot product, you get a squared sine squared theta plus a squared cosine squared theta. Beautiful. So it's a squared d theta, which is just 2 pi a squared. End of story. Okay, so that's a pretty simple example. That is not bad at all. However, I'm definitely going to do a harder one. Now, by the way, here's an interesting observation. Notice that the height of the cylinder did not matter. It's the same no matter what the height is. Sort of bizarre, but that's how it works. If you compute it directly, you'll find that out. Okay, here is a much, well, not a much, but a, a trickier problem. So this is actually not from a final. I take it back. It's from Quiz 5, Spring 2004. So it says, let F be the vector field 3yz minus xz xy. And as usual, we have to have a surface. But before we have a surface, it's giving you another vector field, g, which is 2x, 2y, minus 4z. And so part A says compute the curl of f. All right, let's just do that really quickly. So we set this up. This is how you do a curl. And you just write the field of f here. So it's 3yz minus xz xy. So how much i do we have? F? We have f d dy of xy, which is x, plus d dz of xz, which is x. And you do the same for j, blah, blah, blah. And if you do it correctly, I'm not going to waste time on it, you'll find that you get exactly 2x 2y minus 4z. And you say, ah, that's actually equal to g. Ha. So if you do it correctly, you get g. Sorry that I don't have time to do it, but I've, I've still got to cover the divergence theorem, so there you go. So that's just straightforward determinant stuff. Now, b says this. Let s be the surface of the paraboloid. z equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared above the xy plane just the, the part of the surface above xy plane. And it tells you that the unit normal pointing outwards. And it tells you that's the exterior of the paraboloid. So let's just set this up. The paraboloid goes through 4, 2, minus 2, So unlike the other example, we sort of had 4 minus y squared, but that was a cylinder. This is, instead of a cylinder, this is actually revolved around the z-axis. So it also goes through minus 2, 2 here. So the outer normal is considered this. And so once again, this is not so bad. Actually, this is quite a straightforward problem, as long as you realize that c, again, should be a circle counterclockwise. Again. Everything is fine if it's outwards, you see pointing outwards of the paraboloid. Okay, great. So the question is to find the flux of G. Through S. Which is the double integral of G dot N, D sigma. Now, the point being, it should be a dead giveaway. A, part A above, said compute the curl of F. And we found, or at least I left it to you to finish, that the curl of F is just G. So the trick here, which is not much of a trick, is to replace G by the curl of F. Dot N d sigma. And then you can use Stokes' theorem to write that this is just the integral around the boundary C of f dot dr. And we're actually in a very similar case to before. So before we complete it, we need to do a little bit of work, but it's the same sort of work that we did before. 
it's sort of depressingly similar. There's only so many curves and contours that you can actually compute. So maybe we shouldn't be so surprised. So C is the circle x squared plus y squared equals 4 and z equals 0. So we'll parameterize it by 2 cosine theta, 2 sine theta, 0. And the vector field f was in this problem uh, 3yz minus xz xy, which is actually quite straightforward when you plug in this is x, y, z. z is 0. So this is just 0, 0, and then x, y is 4 sine theta cos or cosine theta sine theta. And so the integral f dot dr, which is just this, is equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 0, 0, 4 cosine theta sine theta dot r, dr. I never worked out dr. Damn it. Take this and work out dr. We need to differentiate. You get minus 2 sine theta, 2 cosine theta, 0 d theta. This is very similar to what I did before. Minus 2 sine theta. 2 cosine theta, 0. And actually, it looks like this is just 0 because 0 times this, 0 times this, and 0 times that. So it's the integral of 0. Is that correct? It is correct. Ta-da! OK, beautiful. All right, so no integral to do at all. Just, if you like, it's the integral of 0 d theta, which is 0. OK. Any questions about Stokes' theorem? And believe me, there will. There will be questions. Because when you do all these final problems that you have access to online, you will find there are many more and harder problems about Stokes' theorem that to be done. Now, don't despair. We will have plenty of time, especially on the Thursday session, I think that's the 24th, to do all these sorts of problems. And I imagine we will do most of them. <laughs> so in the meantime, you need to work with two on the Is there an, an easy way that we should know how to do it getting from, from a function to its anti-curl or whatever it is? Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's a good question. I mean, you see, to compute this, it was brilliant to have the curl. Now, it's possible to do it, but most things doesn't work like that. Okay. It's sort of like... For it to be the curl of something is not, is not always a, a curl that it is. It's very much related to this conservative stuff. And I should just tell you about the conservative stuff. Uh, I, I'm not talking politically here. I'm talking about conservative vector fields. Uh, we looked a little bit before at conservative vector fields. Just to remind you, we decided, so this is, before we do our divergence theorem, I just want to take two minutes and just go over one little aspect. It's hard to examine, so this is more for your knowledge. But we decided a field was conservative if its curl was 0. I put this up quite a few weeks ago now. Uh, that meant that the line integral was supposedly independent of the part, which is the same thing as saying that the integral of f dot dr of any closed loop is 0. That's what that was a theorem that we said before. If a field is conservative, provided it's conservative in a region of space with no holes, it's got to be conservative in this nice closed ball or closed lump. Uh, then, and this is any loop within the lump. We decided the integral of this it was 0, but we never really proved it. But it's actually obvious by Stokes' theorem. See, because this is equal to the double integral of the curl of f dot n d sigma over the surface. So you take any contour, you just take any surface above it, or fleshing it out, and this is equal to this. But by assumption, the curl is 0. So this surface integral is 0. So, but if we need to 
do it, they'll give us, they'll give us what the curl is. I, yeah, I can't imagine this question saying, find an F whose curl is this. It's, it's just too, it's just evil. It's evil. <laughs> All right, last, last topic. Last topic. Green, uh, Green's theorem. Divergence theorem. Stokes theorem. Divergence theorem. Okay, so, yeah, the divergence theorem. So, this actually is the generalization of the other form of Green's theorem. Let me tell you the setup of the divergence theorem. But first, let me get my notes on it instead of my old notes. All right. You've seen the curl, but don't forget there's also a divergence. This is a divergence of f. Divergence of f. And that's actually the dot product of this, which is much easier to take. Much easier to take. So, in some sense, if f is the vector field, say, m n p, then the divergence, so that's a vector field, the divergence of f is just to take the x coordinate and differentiate it with respect to x, the y coordinate and differentiate that with respect to y, the z coordinate and differentiate that with respect to z and add them up. Sort of weird. It's not the same as grad. You can take the div, which is the del dot f, of a vector field, not a scalar. And remember, you could take the curl of a three-dimensional vector field, but you can only take the grad of a scalar field. Okay, it doesn't make sense to go div as in del dot f unless f is a vector field. So these are the three ways you can use this. Div, grad, and curl. But, so this is div, grad, curl. But it's the div or the curl of a vector field, the grad of a scalar. Anyway, now we know what that is, or we've seen it before. So we're in a very similar situation, but now we have a closed surface S, and orientable as well. Yes, so I mean now no boundary. It's different from Stokes theorem. For Stokes theorem, we need to have a boundary. For Stokes theorem, there had to be a boundary. That's that C the contour C that comes up. In the divergence theorem, so one way to tell that you are not in Stokes' theorem case is that you have no boundary. So your S is like a blob, or it encloses a blob. And in fact, I need to give that blob a name. D is the interior. So this surrounds a, a, a volume region, or a space region, D. Okay, so that's the setting. S is the surface that's around it. And now there's a very clear notion of the You cannot debate it. If you're in D and you look out, that's the way to go out. So none of these normal vectors are inside D. They all point outside, away from D. I guess it's possible that D curves around, and yes, you could maybe go back. But I mean, I just, just when you're nearby, you're outside D. So there's a clear concept of an outward normal. And now you have this. So if you work out the flux, this is just the flux. This is the regular flux as we've described, outward flux. OK, so this is not the flux of the curl, like it was over here. There, we're taking the flux of the curl. Here, we're taking the flux of f. So we can write that as a triple integral eh, over d, the interior. So this is the surface. We can write it as the, in the triple integral of just the divergence of f dv. So, this is divergence integral. This has exactly the same flavor. It has the same flavor. If we start with this, this is like a derivative of f. This is a derivative, that this, this is a differential operator. So this is a special derivative of f. And it's saying to integrate the derivative, 
if you do integrate the derivative, you just get the boundary values. And in this case, the boundary of the D is the S. Okay? Now, again, I'll give you a marble interpretation. Okay? Here's what this means. Inside D, I, I have this wind. F is the wind blowing. Okay? So I'm interested at what happens at a little point. So I put a whole lot of marbles right near that point, and I see what happens. Okay, so they can go in all sorts of different directions because of the wind, but there might be an overall outwards feel, or there might be an overall inwards feel. And sort of the way I would think of measuring that is take away all the other marbles and just put marbles there and see what happens a little bit later. Okay, if, imagine also that when they touch this point, there's a little hole in space and they just disappear. So, okay. If I somehow have fewer marbles, net and fewer marbles, marbles so the case, wind blows out of the hole. Anything that blows into the hole, the marble disappears, and anything, if it's blowing out of the hole, I create a marble. So it's sort of hard to see this, but basically I'm just trying to find out the net effect of this wind. Is it going to pull the marbles away from the point, or is it going to push the marbles into the point? Okay, and what's the overall average of that. And so what I'm doing when I do this integral is adding up all these overall effects. Bang, bang, bang. So it's the outwards thrust at every point. Now if I have two points near each other in space, right near each other, and they have this outward thrust, this outward cancels out with this bit outwards. They sort of supply marbles to each other and the net effect is nothing. So if I add up all these little radiation things, you know, next to each other, all the bits next to each other just cancel out. And all I'm left with is what's, so everything inside cancels out. And it's only the bits on the boundary where I'm basically adding up these bits. But even on the boundary, this direction cancels out with this. And all I'm left with actually is the normal bit, which is the flux integral. So the, in some sense, I'm saying, look, if I add up all the little individual flows and cancel them all out, all I get is the overall flow of marbles just through the boundary. The inside bits take care of themselves. Sinks and they're all feeding each other, and the net effect is nothing. But at the boundary, there's nothing to cancel out, and I get that. Anyway, that's just philosophy. <laughs> there's the formula again, and we've got to get practical and do a couple of questions. So I'm just going to finish off with a couple of examples using that formula. So really, again, this is a one formula chapter, but it's a big one and it's sort of counterintuitive in a way. But if you sort of have some idea that you're doing a fundamental theorem, then maybe it makes more sense. Who was asking before? You were on the right track asking, you know, fundamental theorem. Could you, could you uncurl the thing? You know, that's what you really want to do, but not always easy to do. Anyway, here are two problems. I forget which one is easier, so I'll just do them in the order. These are the last two problems on set 11. And yeah, I've got 20 minutes to do them, so hopefully this will be fine. So this is from spring 04 final. And first of all, you had to sketch x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals 2. Uh, then what you want is, so that's part A. Part B is compute the volume of the region inside here, but outside this. No, I'm sorry, I've got it wrong. Outside here, but inside the sphere. x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. And finally, part C is let f be the field y, x, x squared, z. Compute outward flux of f through s. All right. So, well, we know from all the stuff we did before that this should be a hyperboloid, 
and it's of one sheet because that's positive, so I'm not going to dwell on that. I'll just give you the answer. We sort of became a bit of a veteran of these sorts of things. The uh, correct picture that you want to use is like this. And the critical thing is what happens when z equals 0 and you see x squared equals 2, or x squared plus y squared is 2. So this is actually a circle of radius root 2. So that's, you could write it in words, hyperboloid, one sheet, and etc. x intercepts and y intercepts at plus or minus root 2. Okay. okay. Now, the sphere that we care about in the second part has radius 2. So actually 2 is bigger than root 2. So the part that we care about is outside this but inside the sphere. So it's this and this. So it's a sort of ring. It's a hollowed out sphere, but it's not just bored out like that. It's sort of weirdly bored out. Sort of like taking an apple core out of a sphere or something like that. I don't know. It's not too hard to understand. So this is not just two pieces. It's this revolved around the z-axis. Okay? So uh, part two says compute the volume of that region. Now, the hint is that you should use a parameter, you should use some coordinate system that's different. And because the whole thing is very cylindrical, right, the z axis is sort of different from the x and y, we'll just use cylindrical coordinates. So we're going to use x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta, and z is equal to r. That's very much like the, no, z equals z. It's not a cone. I'm confused with my old thing. So we have r cosine theta, we have r sine theta, and z. So we have the three coordinates r, theta, and z. Why did you choose cylindrical and not spherical now? Why do I choose cylindrical and not spherical? I agree that the sphere part of it is spherical, but there's a clear difference in the z direction from the x and the y directions. The problem has cylindrical sy symmetry, but not spherical symmetry. Right? The symmetry is around the z-axis. It has rotational symmetry around the z-axis, just like a cylinder does. So cylindrical coordinates are likely to be the best. But you might be able to do it in spherical coordinates too. My question is, what do we say, what are the bounds of this? I mean, theta is clearly between 0 and 2 pi, because we're not taking half of this picture. But how do you get the bounds of this? Well, we need to work out what is the equation x squared minus z squared equals 2. Well, in cylindrical, it's not so bad. I mean, x squared plus y squared is just r squared. OK, what about the sphere? Well, here you have r squared plus z squared equals 4. So now what we want is actually the interior of the sphere, but the exterior of this. So the region we want has r squared minus z squared has to be bigger than or equal to 2. So this is outside the region, but less than 4. So that's what we're interested in. And if you try to sort of work this out, you'll see that r has to be less than or equal to root 4 minus z squared, but bigger than or equal to root 2 plus z squared. OK, so that is the parameterization sort of bounds that we have. Now the only thing is, where does z go from? For this to be true, for this to make any sense, this quantity has to be less than this quantity, or else there's no, r will sort of be negative, and I mean it will be bigger than something that's smaller than this, so that doesn't really make, uh, that's bigger than this rather, so. Minus z there? Where is it? Oh, did I get this wrong? I did get this wrong. Uh, it's plus on both. No, 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 no. I'm just, I, I wrote it down correctly, but I need, I, I was being a little hasty, I need r squared minus z squared less than 2, but I need r squared plus z squared less than 4. That's the interior of the sphere. And so if I do convert this, yes, r squared r has to be from this one. Thanks for pointing this out. What so. did you change just now? Oh. Okay. Asked and answered. All right. So I got the correct inequality, but I got it from the two... 
Like, I, I was a little bit confused with all these pluses and minuses. But for this to be valid, I kind of want to know when this equals this, because that will give me the range of z. You see, I can't really see where is z going from. I, I need to find that intersection height and that intersection height to finish this problem. So to do that, I really want to know when 2 plus z squared equals 4 minus z squared. And if you solve this, you get 2z squared is equal to 4. No, equals 2. So z equals plus or minus 1. So that means that this only applies for z between minus 1 and 1. If z is bigger than 1, then actually that quantity is bigger than this quantity, and the inequality doesn't make any sense. So finally, we can say that this is our parameterization, where z is between minus 1 and 1. By the way, that finds we found this height. This height is minus 1, and this height is 1. That was not obvious, but that's what it turns out to be. And then r goes between root 2 plus z squared and 4 minus z squared. This problem takes so long, I don't even see how I'm going to get to do the other one. But maybe I'll, maybe I will. If not, we've always got the last three sessions. Whichever one I, you know, if I don't get through one, I'll, I'll use it as an example anyway. Do others. Okay, so finally, let's just do this volume. Let's do this volume. The volume is the triple integral over this region. Cylindrical is r dr d theta. Okay, so this says r goes from root 2 plus z squared up to root 4 minus z squared. And Oh, I left out the z. Okay, theta goes from zero to two pi, and z goes from minus one to one. All right, I'm going to leave this to you. It's a standard sort of triple integral, and you can unwind it, and you get eight pi over three. Okay, again, that has nothing to do with the divergence theorem. However, the last part does. It says compute the out outward flux of this is not e. This is f underline through s. So for part C, we're looking for the outward flux f dot n. Now, when it says through s, what is s? What is s? Let me just make sure I get this right. OK, s is the boundary surface of this region. So it is actually the whole boundary, not, not just the outer part of the boundary. Thank goodness for that. So this is what we need. This is the outward flux. And according to the divergence theorem, this becomes a triple integral over the region itself of the divergence of f dv. So this is divergence theorem. So we're computing the flux integral into an easier integral, perhaps. We just need to compute what the divergence of f was. So f, to remind you, is y x x squared z. So the divergence of f is just the x derivative of the x coordinate plus the y derivative of the y coordinate plus the z derivative of the z coordinate. Well, that's 0, that's 0, and that's just x squared. So we need to compute. So this integral is equal to the triple integral of x dv. But we're going to use the same coordinates, uh, x squared, thank you, dv. So we're going to use the same coordinates. We've done all the hard work. But instead of just having dv, we have x squared dv. So we just need to stick another x squared. So what is x squared? Well, you've got to come back over here and see that x is r cosine theta. And then you shove it in. r squared cosine squared theta. And then you have r dr d theta dz. So you combine this 
and of course you're going to write this as r cubed. And so you just have to repeat the triple integral, but instead of r, you have r cubed. And again, I'm not going to do it for you. This is something that you should really make sure you know how to do. And if I've done it correctly, you get 4 pi. And the advantage of not doing that is we can do one more divergence theorem problem, which this one is sort of quick enough to just do. Okay. okay. This one I can definitely do in five minutes. I actually have one more, much trickier one, but I'm going to have to save that for the next review sessions. When I do this again, of course, I'm just sort of going to state the theorem. I'm not even going to try to talk about marbles and like that, and we'll just do it in 10 minutes or 15 minutes with one problem instead of half an hour. Anyway, here goes. Last one. This is actually from problem set 10. It's from the spring 03 final. And it says, compute the flux of the vector field F, which is x cubed i plus y cubed j plus z cubed k across sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals z. All right, so the hint is to use spherical coordinates. Now, here's the deal. This is a sphere. If you can't see it, you just complete the square like this. I've done that in, sort of in my head, but if you expand it out, you can see you get z squared minus z plus a quarter. The quarters will cancel out, and the minus z comes on the other side. So this is a sphere that is radius a half, centered at 0, 0, a half. OK, that's the sphere, radius a half. OK, if this were not a closed surface, and we were computing the flux of a curl, you would use Stokes theorem. But since it is a closed surface, and it's just a flux, then you can use the divergence theorem. So what we want to do is start off and say, look, what we're looking for, and by the way, out, it says, it doesn't say, but it's assumed that it's outward, which is good. Otherwise, the thing is not quite right. You need a minus. OK, so what we're looking for is the flux across the outside of the sphere S, f dot n d sigma, by the divergence theorem, this trip, the triple, trip to green ball, of the div dv, where d is the inside of the sphere. S is the, just the surface of the sphere. D is the ball, the inside of the sphere. Now, we should compute the divergence. All you do is you take the x coordinate, x cubed, d dx of that, plus d dy of the y coordinate, plus d dz of the z coordinate, and you get 3x squared plus 3y squared plus 3z squared. So we have to find the integral, the triple integral of that quantity, 3x squared plus 3y squared plus 3z squared dv. No surface integral. Everything just becomes a regular old triple integral. But the d is that nasty little sphere there. So the hint is to use spherical coordinates. OK, so if you do spherical coordinates, what you have to do is work out what the hell is going on. So <laughs> here you have x is equal to r sine phi cosine theta. y is r sine phi sine theta. z is r cosine phi. But we don't need a whole sphere. We need to be a lot more careful about it. So we need to take a point. I'll just draw this again. We need to take a point here. So we. First of all, it's sitting there. It goes up to 1. So I need to take a ray starting at the origin and work out where it busts out of that sphere. Where does it bust out of that sphere? What's this distance here? Uh, actually, we don't use r, do we? We use rho. Sorry about that. We we'll use rho. So I need to work out what is that length rho. Well, you may recall that this is phi. And, you know, it doesn't matter what theta is because everything is symmetric around the z-axis. So 
this is a this is the angle in a semicircle. We've seen these sorts of tricks before when we did it, polar coordinates and spherical coordinates. And this length is one because the center is at a half and the radius is a half. So rho, if you take cosine phi, is rho over one. So rho is cosine phi when it leaves. So you're inside the sphere and when you get up to cosine phi, it leaves. So what you find, is that rho is between 0 and cosine of phi. OK, great. Where does phi go from? 0 normally goes all the way up to pi. But here, it's got to stop when you get to pi over 2, because you don't have any bit of the sphere underneath the axis. So careful. This will be, you'll get this wrong if you, that's to be careful about, because you're just above pi, 0, pi over 2, that would be more. And then finally, uh, theta is nice and just goes from 0 to 2 pi. So this integral, oh, by the way, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is rho squared. In coordinates, you square those, you add them up, and the trig gives you rho squared. So this integral becomes, this is this integral here, triple integral of just 3 rho squared. However, don't forget the Jacobian in spherical coordinates is rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta. Kind of had to squish that in there. I'll write it up here. d rho d phi d theta. So that's the Jacobian, and that is the function. And now rho goes from 0 to cosine phi. Phi goes from 0 to pi over 2 and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. And again, it is a standard triple integral from this point. I mean, you have to, you get 3 rho to the 4th. When, when you integrate that, you're going to get a rho to the 5th. So you actually get a cosine phi to the 5th. But it's a fairly simple substitution to finish it off. And let me just tell you what the answer is, and then I'm out of time. The answer worked out to be... No, that's not it. Oh, here it is. Bloody hell. I wrote, yuck, use the divergence theorem. I worked it out myself. You see, it was stuck on review session t uh, 10, which is before the divergence theorem. And I tried to work it out, and I wrote, yuck, use the divergence theorem, because I couldn't do it directly. So I think it was misplaced on this and should have been on this. Uh, anyway, I believe it works out to be pi over 5. So you should check your answers to this. I do. Welcome any emails about, you know, in the next couple of weeks before we get back in earnest and say, hey, I, I couldn't finish that triple integral. In which case, either I made a mistake or you did, and I'd be happy to sort it out by email. Okay, so that's the end of that part of the thing. Study hard. Good luck with all the papers and the Dean's Date stuff. Don't forget to spend a little time on this Math 201 because the final's coming up in a little bit. But we will reconvene, I believe, on the 22nd. All right.